Hey, I'm Lou Brutus. Always a pleasure to be joined by my friend David Draymond, who is there in that stinking hellhole they call Hawaii. How are you, David? I can't complain too much or somebody should probably smack me. So <laughs> I know how much you love it down there. You seem to be enjoying life down there since you made the move. Very much so. I, I love being, you know, in perfect weather all the time. I love the vibe of the island. I love the people here. It's very laid back, very chill. My Are you much of a beach guy? Oh, yeah. Big time. Life is pretty damn good. It doesn't suck. I, 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 I'm, I'm very blessed, Lou, as, as, as you know. So as of the recording of this, your next trip to the mainland is going to be to play with Nita Strauss. And the last time we spoke, Nita was with us and you guys were actually premiering the, uh, the tune at that point. First of all, you've got to be really excited the way people have devoured that tune. It's a great piece of work. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I'm, I couldn't be more pleased, really. It's, uh, it was just one of those stereotypical magic rock and roll moments, you know? It happened. Fire was struck and we fanned the flame. It was really, really cool. It doesn't always come out that way. You know, sometimes you have to really bleed to make a song happen and really, really like force it out. <clears throat> there was no forcing anything with this. It was really an amazing experience. Um, 48 hours of serendipity and pure creativity and me bugging the hell out of the both of them, her, her and her, her, her boy Josh for the better part of a week till we finally tracked it. And now here it is, you know, killing it all over the place. I couldn't be more proud. And there's certainly, there's no one more deserving than her. I'm very happy for her success with this. It's been so strange for so many folks um, who have sort of gotten back in the saddle again post-pandemic lockdowns to get back in the studio for the first time, to get back on stage for the first time. When you went in to, to cut the vocal tracks for the tune, was it like, whoa, I'm in a studio. This is, this is weird again. Oh, it was awesome again. I've been dying. I've been dying. I've been dying the whole pandemic, to be honest, to just create. And, and you know, definitely that went in a bunch of different directions. Did, did a track with the Saul guys, did a track with Hyrule the Hero, Talented Rapper. Did I have a bunch of little baby things that you guys don't know about yet that I'm still working with? Baby band stuff. And then um, the Nita thing, you know, so, so getting in front of that microphone finally again in a studio environment and finally being able to execute what was in my head in front of them, because it's one thing to text message stuff and give little samples or to even try to acapella sing something over a part that you're playing on the phone. It's not the most precise way to, you know, reveal an idea. So it really took, like when I first threw the verse idea at Nita, she thought it was about a whole half bar behind where I was placing it. And she was like, oh, that's a really a cool different kind of rhythmic placement for this idea. And it was, it was totally wrong. It wasn't even what I originally intended. So once we finally got in the studio and were able to clarify things, that's when I began to discover how much more she was adding to the equation even after the fact. And Josh as well. They're, they're really a, a true creative force. It's impressive. Now compare that to getting back on stage for the first time, because I know you had been chomping at the bit. And, and as I've told you off mic before, I was so worried about Dan Donegan from Disturbed because I thought Dan was, was getting a little loopy without being able to go on stage. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Danny is an addict of the live experience as much as anyone. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he had been constantly putting it out there. Please let us go play. Please let us go play. And I was totally in the same mindset. And so finally to have the opportunity and to, to be able to breathe again, you know, literally. This is what we were born to do. This is what we love. This is who we are. And to have that taken from you for so long with no power to restore it that's in your own hands is a hell of a thing you know i i think a lot of people suffered some semblance of that in one way shape or form or another during these past couple of years and for artists who are blessed to be able to do what we do at the level we do it it's an incredible void that's left it truly is so getting back out there 
and doing it in the way that we did and now capping it off with that Welcome to Rockville set, that was a nice way to do it. How are Dan's stage jumps? <laughs> They're still up there, although I think all of us are feeling our uh, appendages and our knees and our issues and we now have to do different things to uh, compensate, like, uh, you know, things like braces and things like pain medication and things like probably more cannabis than I should be consuming for my own good and you know, stuff like that. <laughs> well, again, you, you had your surgeries and stuff years ago, and I think it was at that point you also sort of, and I, I don't mean this in the way it's going to sound, but you learned how to sing uh, in, a, in a lot healthier way than you did because you used to just go out and I remember back in the old days we were all kids you just bash it out and then do it again for the next 15 yeah, straight nights yeah can't do that anymore that's for damn sure um, particularly as we've progressed in our career and the material has become more and more challenging and more complex and diverse it requires a different level of uh of sacrifice and of discipline and and now add age to the equation do it <laughs> it's uh, we're, I, I've, I've definitely consistently been my own worst enemy and writing the songs that i have and the way that they're written and them being as difficult as they are to execute but i wouldn't have it any other way you know, it's gotta i think that it only tastes good if you have if you have to suffer for it a little bit now then, where are you guys at on new music? Because uh, again, I'm I'm friends with everybody in the band on social media, and when we kibitz off air all the time, Dude. I keep hearing chirp, 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 chirp. But what? Where it's, are we at? It's on in a big, big, big fucking way. It really, really is. I mean, we are so genuinely excited. We, yeah. You know, they asked me going in, you know, where do you want to go with this? I'm like. I want to go back. I want to go back to our meat and potatoes. I want to go back to where we came from. And the week in between the Indiana shows and the Daytona show was amazing. We pumped out six new Disturbed songs. They are rhythmic. They are anthemic. They are polysyncopated. They are meat and potatoes disturbed. It's somewhere between the sickness and 10,000 fists as far as vibe. And it's can't stop but bob your head kind of thing. It, it, it's, I couldn't be more happy. And we're just so genuinely excited that we don't want to wait. Like we're going to track it after the new year. We're, we're guns blazing right now. And again, do you know where you're tracking? Do you know who's pretty, like, like give me all this. We're still trying to suss stuff. all that out. We've, 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 we've written with, uh, we've written with a couple guys. We're trying to, you know, just kind of, go wherever we're going to be able to find a little spark of inspiration here and there. So we're still trying to suss everything out. And the way that I see it happening is we're probably not going to put out um, something in the traditional full length. We're probably going to be doing two separate releases. So we'll probably have one geared for release if everything works as planned by the fall and then maybe something uh, the following year as well. It's kind of so again, you're and it's, so I'm understanding you correctly. So we're talking like EP length. Thing? Yeah, I mean, define it what you want, but it would be like five or six songs at a pop, something like that. Um, you know, we live in an environment right now and in an age where people's consumption of music has become very soundbite-ish and very track-driven and very single-driven, and you know. There's definitely some beauty to or continuing to try and pioneer things like concept records and telling a long story over the duration of a series of songs. And there's huge merit to that. But I think that, you know, it, it's when you write 10 songs and three of them actually get worked at radio. And maybe if you're lucky, the fans are really familiar with half the record and the rest ends up sitting on a shelf. And if you do end up pulling it out one day, it's like an obscure, weird moment during the set. And it's almost like gratuitous for yourself. You know, it, it, I, I, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to make everything count. I want to make sure that we get the biggest bang for everything we're putting out there. And, you know, I, I, I think that that should be easily attainable. I th it, it seems to be 
where the environment is going and it seems to be where, whether we like it or not, where the digital age has funneled us into. And again, there is longstanding precedent for releases like that going back to the, the mid 60s for the Beatles, the Who, the Rolling Stones, who would they'd release a single and another single and an EP and another saying, hey, we got enough to cobble together for an album. Right. Uh, and that's just how that when they had a good song, they released it. That's yeah. that's the way it should be. You know, yeah. we're, we're, we're so excited with this current grouping. We really don't want to wait. I mean, it's crazy good. Get in get it done because i can't wait to play it for everybody around the country so it's Amen, a that. well there are a few pleasures in this life greater than speaking to jonathan davis of corn hello jonathan how are you i'm good bro how are you i'm doing all right before we talk new music if i uh, may pry into your life a little bit okay. how you feeling i feel good man i'm feeling excited um got new music out life's good Just did that tour got through that um, I recovered from COVID all right, so thank God for that. That was hard on me. Um, overall, I'm in a good place. Very excited. Yeah, when did you realize you had it, and, I, you know, what did it feel like? Well, I tested positive on the 14th of August, and I was at a gig at in Scranton, and uh, my girl had tested positive three days prior, I believe. So I was hoping I kept testing. It was like negative, negative, negative. I was like, oh, I just dodged a bullet. And then I popped positive. And I was scared shitless. <laughs> I was freaking out. Um, but I got into, they took me right, they rushed me right to the hospital. And they did all these tests on me. They said, okay, you, it doesn't look like you have the markers for the bad. We'll let you go. And it never went in my lungs. Thank God, it was just, I was totally wiped out. I couldn't move. Just the body aches. And, the, and uh I didn't eat for a month, damn near, and the taste is all the normal one. Uh, normal, but thank, yeah, thank God I didn't go in my lungs. That would have freaked me really out. But I got through it. I tested negative on like the 25th, I think, and I played the show the next day. And I was beat up, but I just couldn't find it in my heart to try to, I just wanted to get through it because I saw, I saw, saw how happy people were to see live music. And I just didn't want to let no one down. So I'm like, I'm just going to sit down. I'll get through this. At least it's a live show. And I'm going to just give it my all. And we just pulled it off. I did the whole tour. And uh, everything out went off. You know, unfortunately, Monkey got it. And Ray got it. But uh, we got through it. We just had some bad luck. But it is what it is. And we're here all alive and happy. So it was overall a good thing. So let me sincerely say, I am so fucking glad you're here. And it's good to see you. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> so um, um, let, let's put Requiem, the new album, in sort of a, a, a timeline for writing and recording, because I'm, I'm really a little bit unclear on it all. So please kind of walk me through it. So right when the pandemic hit, when there was a couple months, we were all freaking out. And so I think we, we just got off the road with Breaking Ben and we went home. And that was March, April, May. I think we started writing in June and we had it done uh, by I think January or February. So it'd been in, it'd been done. This thing's like well over a year old in my book. <laughs> I've been listening to it, listening to it for a while, but uh, we just get together and we do these one week blocks at our studio and then go home for the rest of the month. And uh, we just started writing. And it, the, the thing about it that was so amazing is we had nowhere to be. We had all the time in the world. Usually when we do records, you know, I would, everyone up our ass trying you know you got this tour booked or that and i'm the one that gets fucked every time with the time because the band has all the time to do that what they need to do and when it comes to my turn i'm the last oh we got this tour you better hurry up and so we didn't know what was going to happen we just made the record and got to spend all this you know time we usually wouldn't have on on making it was it was a really cool experience and it really shows that's why i'm so excited about it Start the Healing seems, uh, I don't want to say it's an obvious song title for these times, but it's its certainly a very apropos one. Tell me yeah. about creating this one. Like all the corn songs, we just come in and, and write, and I think kind of just wrote itself. It's like we all get on the same page. I can channel this thing. And the music was done. And for me, lyrically, um, I write stream of conscious. I don't know what I'm talking about half the time. I just write what's going on in my brain. And I think the song's basically me. Um, dealing with always being in that dark place and I think it's a back and forth of feeling guilt and 
when your head's talking and feeling, making you be in that place of guilt and the darkness, it's up to you to get out of it. So it's back and forth. It's like, okay, I'm tired of this shit. It's time for me to start getting better. And that's really what the song's about. It's just like, okay, I'm in charge of my own destiny. I'm in charge of my own happiness. Block everything out, whatever that may be, and let it go. And then that's when you're really going to start to feel better and start healing whatever that is that's going on. So that's what it's about. And I think you more so than perhaps anybody I've spoken to, and I've, I've spoken to a, a lot of artists over the course of the last 30, 40 years, but writing seems like a therapy for you. It totally is. I love it. It's my favorite thing is to create and, and do that and then go perform it in the world. Cause every night it's a therapy session for me and I get all that negative energy out and uh, I feel good after I'm done. So uh, what is the, uh, the future looking like, say the next six to 12 months? I mean, put singles out, another single record drops and then we go tour. Pretty much. I think we're booked to do uh, a no, summer tour in Europe if that happens great and then we're working on what we're going to do touring wise but we'll be touring all next year for sure what what ha- again it's, it's another obvious question but you know what have you not done yet with corn that you would like to do um I never think about that I mean I really don't it's just I love playing shows so I mean I'd love I think we've done pretty much everything from everything. I mean, I'd love to do a headline stadium run if we ever got to that, that, that level. I mean, I can shoot super high. I'd love to do that. But I mean, thinking back, I've pretty much done everything I mean, in 27 years, but it's not old. It doesn't get old to us. Is there some exotic locale you have not played yet that you think, oh man, we, we've, we've got to take the band there. I mean, I think we played damn near. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of any other places. No, I. I mean, I love to do more international gigs. You know, when everything opens up, it'll be cool. But we played everywhere from Africa to, you know, the Philippines. We've done everywhere, but it's just still fun. I don't know when people get. I don't. If we get burnt, I guess it call it, but. Right now, we're having too much fun. Well, one last thing before I let you go. And and in all the years I've been speaking to you, I don't think I've, I've ever asked you, and I was a big fan of this guy's um, back when I was a kid, but your mic stand is very famously done by yes. the artist H.R. Geiger. Yeah. Uh, t- tell me the story about getting it done, because he had been involved in rock and roll going back, at least yeah. to my knowledge, the Emerson Lake and Palmer like brain cell Palmer. surgery album. Yeah. Yeah. He did stuff with, with Debbie Harry. I mean, it's all kinds of different stuff. So I was a huge Geiger fan. And the idea came from my assistant at the time, little Jonathan Pervasi. He said, oh, man, we got to hook you guys up because you love them so much. We got to figure out something. Let's make you like a mic stand or something. I was like, that's an amazing idea. So I'm like, how do we do this? So we found his agent and Jonathan called him up. And we went back and forth and Giger was open to the idea. So we were on tour in Europe and I went to his house and talked to him and he sent me a couple sketches. And when I first went there, he goes, <clears throat> come here after show me the house. And took me on a ride on the Harkonnen train through his backyard and all the sculptures. I was like tripping, dude. I was like, I'm in oh. HR Giger's house on his train. And it was amazing. <laughs> so we get done. He goes, come back here. And there was this little wood shed and that was his workshop. He took me back there and he pulled it out of the corner. It was all done in clay. He had sculpted in clay. He goes, you like this? And they set the, they set the, the height for me. I go, this is beautiful, man. And uh, he did, he sent it off to the, to, to get, to get uh, cast, I guess, in, in aluminum. And I got the thing. And so the first version, it had a big, huge back head. And I knew if I, I'd take my damn head off if I hit that thing. So I had him shave it down. But after we went back and forth a, little, a couple of times, he got it perfect. And I got it in 2000. And I couldn't believe he did that for me. But and then that started our friendship. And every time I went to York and did a tour, I'd always stop by and hang out at his house for the night. And we became friends and it killed me when he passed. But that thing is my precious. It's my most prized possession. There's two of them or three of them in the world. We we're supposed to do five, but the other two never got made. So there's three of them, one in his museum. And I have two, one in Europe and one here. So I don't have to travel with them back and forth. But it's uh, they're just. I don't know. That's my most prized possession, I guess. Um, they're just 
to have someone like that do that for me is amazing. And, and again, when you're walking around his house, I, I would have to think it was filled just with interesting shit and sketches, just everywhere, like all this it's stuff. Amazing. That- yeah, he had, he had a lot of his, his paintings are, are full wall because he they were huge. They're like the size of a wall. That's how he airbrushed. So I always go in and we'd sit and live in his like living room kitchen kind of thing because it's in Switzerland and we just sit there and have, we always drink apple juice or something like that. And we kick back and talk for hours. I always go see him. He's just like me. He's a night owl. He gets up around five and he's up all night. Just like I'm up all night. I'm a vampire. And we just hang out and just talk about art and all kinds of things. He's such an amazing dude. Really had a great time hanging out with him and seeing all his sculptures and going to the museum and seeing all his art. Just there'll never be another master like him. He basically invented a whole kind of class of art that biomechanical art. And it's amazing. And I don't know what else I can say. It's just it's crazy <laughs> that I still have all this. And I got that in 2000, I believe, 2001. So I've had it that long. Well, listen, Jonathan, it's always great to see you. I'm, I'm so glad that you're doing well. And you. uh, I'm just very excited for the, the new album. And uh, man, again, I can't wrap my tiny pea-sized fucking head around it. But 27 years, that's a damn good run. And to see you still run. running strong, it makes me very, very happy. Thank you, Lou so much.